Hi everyone, welcome to Type Talks. Today we have Linda Behrens. And so Linda, would you like to tell us a bit about you? Oh, <laughs> there's a lot to tell, uh, but not much. So I've been using um, personality type for um, since 1971, no, five, 75. So, that's a long time. <laughs> yeah, I think that's when I was introduced to it. And I was introduced to Kersey's temperament theory in a psychopathology class. So in a master's for counseling. So it was about how people go crazy, the mm -hmm. way they become dysfunctional in it. And at the end, he said about 20 minutes out of a three hour course, um, he, he would say, well, here's what this one looks like when they're functioning well. And then we later were introduced to the Myers-Briggs and the, um, the dichotomies were explained in another class. And then I got involved in the Association for Psychological Type when it got started in 1981, 80, something like that. And we, um, and I got exposed to Jungian theory um, a little bit then, but a whole lot later. <laughs> and uh, it turns out that I'm obsessed. Mm, yes. Yeah. So it's the best obsession out there. I'm not biased at all. <laughs> no, me neither. So it, it, it turns out that um, I was a school psychologist for a while, did a little bit of therapy, a little bit of business consulting. Uh, continued some of the, you know, workshops and things like that for businesses uh, when I started something that we called Temperament Research Institute, later changed the name to Interstrength Associates. Um, and then uh, now it's called Interstrength, just plain Interstrength, the idea of developing your internal strength and your interpersonal strength. So that's pretty much what I do. So I teach people online how to do our process. In 2017, I started doing that. Um, we, we have an integrated three personality lenses, temperament theory, which we now call essential motivators because temperament got confusing. Because uh, there is another temperament theory, which means, you know, like the temperament of dogs or, or the temperament of people, which, you know, uh, nervous babies, calm babies, that kind of thing. And that actually relates to that other version of temperament, which is the classical psychological one, relates to a, a model that we developed called interaction styles. So you have four essential motivator patterns, four interaction styles, so four ways to express each of those, and you get to 16 personality types. And then you can unpack those types with cognitive dynamics. Extroverted sensing and introverted sensing are really very different. And so, the, and the same is true for all of the processes. So you think, oh, I have an intuitive preference, but mine's extroverted and my daughter's is introverted. And so when we're working together, our preferred ways of working don't match. Because if I start talking and spinning off ideas, she winds up losing the image that which is really your greatest gift to bring so really good rundown linda oh, thanks. so linda is the originator the creator of interaction styles and so if you've heard that term thrown around it came from linda right here <laughs> well with a lot of help from my colleagues and participants you know proofing by people who um, we wrote these four descriptions based from interviews that we did. From we did we we created a booklet about it's called understanding yourself or self and others the sixteen personality types descriptions for self discovery and there are first person descriptions based on interviews. So we took those same interviews and I pulled the things that I thought would fit this interaction styles and then we sent it out to people we knew and said does this fit you and then we got feedback and send it out again and got feedback and then now we have these descriptions that that can be helpful and useful so. that's amazing <laughs> could you give us a brief description of each of the interaction styles yeah they're pretty straightforward um one is in charge 
And of course, the downside of that is people think you have to be the person in charge to have that style, but you don't. In charge has to do with um, wanting to get you know uh, things accomplished, and then there's get things going, which is about really getting a lot of interaction and involvement toward a goal. And chart the course. And those who have a chart the course style want to anticipate. It. And they, it's not like they always want to plan. Some varieties want to have a plan, but others just want to have an anticipation of what's going to happen. And then there's behind the scenes, which is about um, pulling in information from a lot of sources and getting the best result possible. Behind the scenes wants to get the best result possible. In charge wants to get an achievable result. Chart the course wants to get a desired result because part of anticipating is what's the resi- re- result going to be. And the get things going wants to have an embraced result so that people have bought into it, that it's actually going to be supported. So there's room for all of those. Really well explained, Linda. Bravo. (laughs) (laughs) And that's a magnificent contribution to type because it'll really help some people figure out their type to be able to know the general categories of what they might relate to more. So you Mm -hmm. made it more understandable. You took a really large concept and you made it digestible. So thank you for that. Thank you, welcome. Well, it's actually a really good entree because people get it right away. And um, one of the things that David Kersey contributed, and I built that off of some things he contributed, he said, if we took, um, you know, some types are role directive and some are role informative, meaning that some people are really comfortable with telling people what to do and some people are um, comfortable with informing and then leaving the option to act to them. So. That's part of how interaction styles got started. As we started, I I put tape on the floor and I made a matrix and then I would have people, I would talk about that directing and informing and I would have people go stand in in that place. And then there was another dimension that intersected with that, which is, that was, he said that one year at a conference, the next conference he talked about um, initiating and responding, which is, you know, making the first move in a relationship or waiting to see what, what the relationship's gonna be like before you start to interact. And that relates somewhat to extroversion and introversion, so it's pretty easy for people to get, but it's not the same thing. It's really about making that first move. How comfortable are you? So that then, I would put people, you know, they're, they're in the matrix, <laughs> so to speak, according to those things. And then that was usually laid in a workshop, and by that time I could make up stories about the people and what they might be like. And so that's how we started with it. And sometimes you could do a day with a team, you could have discussions for a whole day on directing and informing. Just be prepared to unpack and facilitate a lot of conflict (laughs) because there's probably already been a lot of conflict with that. So, yeah. That is fascinating indeed. (laughs) And so Linda, I would like to ask you a bit about the factors that contribute to how certain types show up a little differently. Why are there different flavors of INTP that exist? What contributes to these variations? Oh, well, one of my passions is helping people get to their best fit. So a lot of times it's an instrument that leads people astray because they wind up responding for a variety of reasons. Could be the instrument isn't well developed and so that's you know one of the things is the instrument itself when you use an instrument. But when it gets down to giving people good descriptions and they can identify what fits them, um, they still sometimes have a, you know a bit of a, of a of a challenge. And if you were say just doing interaction styles as an intro, um, a lot of times you know someone who has an in charge role may have learned that if they don't tell people what to do things don't get done. So they've adapted some in-charge behaviors. Or maybe they they haven't been, this happens with in-charge, those women with an in-charge preference oftentimes wind up having to shut it down and stuff it because that's how women are not supposed to behave in the particular culture you're in. So one of the things that affects our ability to think about who we are 
is the context that we've been in and whether or not we were acceptable in that context. So whether, whether who we are uh, got kind of squashed, which is a, a kind of trauma. Trauma in general makes a big difference. So in order to survive in traumatic situations, sometimes um, you, you stuff all of who you are and it doesn't come out for a while. Um, so so I, now I forgot what your question was. Yeah, it was what makes one INTP different from another INTP? Oh, okay. What causes different flavors or different combinations of a type? Okay, so there's several things. I think it would be good if I show this graphic. Yeah. So here's here's the what we come into the world with, you know, like there's what's called the zeitgeist. Right now from COVID, for example, there's a certain kind of zeitgeist, a tenor of the time. Um, the structures that are there, you know, organizations, different the ways organizations are structured, for example, the way families are structured. There are cultural memes, they're like themes that are there in the culture. And then there are systems that are in place that sort of affect uh, who we are. But we have a core self, that, that's who we are at our core. And I see that as a template that's there when you're born, uh, when you're conceived, I suppose. Um, and, and some of that shows up in the way um, our brains are wired and, and the, way, the way our physiology is. So there's the, something that's there at the core. And so when we're working with personality patterns, we're trying to help people understand what's at their core. And sometimes that's quite a big job. And when they come into the world, there are all of these things going on. And, you know, there's situations happen, you know, so they have a family with a particular configuration where someone fits. And, and so they grow up really fine and, you know, with no, you know, they feel good about who they are. So, for example, I had a, a friend who had a friend who would come home from school and she would explain to her mother how, how all these things that she knew. And her mother said, you don't have to explain those things. This person had INFP preferences. And so there was a family where that she fit. Her, her parents had NF preferences, both of them. And then there was her brother who had a different set of preferences, SP preferences, for example. And he didn't quite fit, you know, so she was able to notice some differences in, in their development. She was one of my faculty members at the time and shared that. So we have situations and then, you know, other things happen, all kinds of things. And so we respond to these situations with our current behavior. And this is something that we are very, we can be very adapt at, and we have a contextual self. So there's this contextual self that is the, the way we are in a particular context. So context is a big variable in terms of our development and how we express ourselves. So the context puts all this pressure on us to develop in a certain way. However, the core self has a roadmap for development and it says, no, develop this way. So, we're, you know, we, we, you don't have to teach a baby how to walk usually. Babies pull themselves up. They start, you know, they start developing them. So they fall down a whole lot, but they, you know, they take their first steps. They learn, they crawl. They start talking usually. And it helps when they have models of people talking to them. So, you know, they get the, the learning language. But, but there is this core self that wants to emerge. And then there is this external pressure and what happens with that is we have our tendency is to adapt and grow in response to these pressures. And out of that, then we have what we call our developed self. Now, I tell people when I'm doing a workshop or a one on one thing that that your developed self is who you are. You're not just your core self and you're not just your contextual self. And and so what we're looking for, uh, well, and, and there's a ring I would put around there now if I were going to redo this graphic. I'd put another little ring around that, which is the culture. Because culture is a, an influence that's laid down very, very early. And it was, it was a, one of my colleagues from years ago, when culture started to be something that organizations trained in, 
And uh, she's the one that said she would draw a little circle around there and put in culture because she worked for the World Bank and she saw how culture really influenced. Like one of her colleagues, they, you know, they would talk and work together on developing programs and things like that as equals. The minute they walked into the bosses, you know, to their supervisor, his behavior instantly changed. He came from, I think, um, an Eastern culture where power distance was a big, a big thing, you know. And so you respect, like respecting your elders, you res you show respect when there's a distance in in power, and that 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 didn't affect who he was as his core. And and so what we have is a constant core. And that's what we're trying to look for. So people, some people think type changes. I think the measurement of type changes. I can tell you I'm 70, oh dear, wait a minute, 77, I think. So I've only been that for a couple of weeks, so I can't remember. But anyway, so, so all of these years, I've had lots of practice. Regardless of how much development I've had, like I'm, I'm kind of known um, for creating a learning community that feels really safe for instead of it just being didactic. Um, for INTP preferences, you wouldn't expect that. But I've had a lot of development, a lot of coaching, a lot of therapy, um, you know, training as a therapist, um, and a lot of learning from my daughter who has the NFJ preferences and affiliating with people with extroverted feeling preferences. So, you know, I learned those things. But when I get stressed, I'm back at the INTP preferences. That's constant. That doesn't go away. And I can almost always identify that my stress or momentary depression or whatever it might be is related to feeling overwhelmed like there's so much more new to learn. And so it's, the, the core is constant. And I've, I've seen that in many, many people that they, they develop over time because I've you know, had contact with them. Some people develop more than others uh, for some reason and who knows why. So anyway, so that's, this is my little graphic that I like to, to help people put a frame around what we're doing and there are so many things that influence, you know, externally how we develop and who we are. That was a brilliant graphic, Linda. I love the idea of how the core self plus the contextual self equals your developed self. Mm -hmm. It's true yeah. because you are both a platter of nature and nurture. And right. that's a beautiful way of describing it. Yeah. And, and the, and, we're starting to undertake, um, one of our students is, um, uh, her field of study has been culture. And then we have some advanced, uh, some students who've been with us for a while who have the same type preferences. But they, you know, what, one is, let's say, one is from the Middle East and one is from here, from the US. And so we're pairing people up, getting them talking, we have another one from France or Belgium, sorry, but French, French speaking Belgium, and another, you know, and, and people from the US. And so we're starting to see if they can articulate what's, what, how that's impacted their type preferences. I don't know where this study's gonna go. I don't know how long it will take, but you know, the, the family you grow up in, if you're, you know, I grew up in the Midwest in a farming community I got my degree, my bachelor. My, well, no, I had my first two years of college in in Kansas. You know, so um, there are a lot of things that I can can look back and say those those actually influence who I am mm -hmm. as much as as someone say in New York. And so, oftentimes, for example, when I'm describing interaction styles, people from the South have. There's Southern United States have, uh, you know, there's a politeness, there's a, there's, they, they tend to use informing language, whether that's their preference or not. And people in New York City 
it's boom, 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 more directing language you're going to see. So even even like where you grow up and, and that kind of culture, or it could be the family culture. Mm. And so, you know, you could come from China and have fa a family that grew up in China. And so that tight knit family could make a big difference in terms of the influences you have. And Dario Nardi, uh, well, I always thought that, you know, your first developmental task is to, is, uh, is uh, do I get to be me? That's the first thing you're confronted with in a way. The minute you start to do anything, you know, it, it'll either be allowed or not. <laughs> and and uh, one of the things Dario Nardi had a, a theory of development that he, he looked at and he called that, you know, that question, do I get to be me? Um, is, is the first, also the first step. And so there are things that happen. When your environment says, no, you don't get to be me, you have a couple choices. You say, I'm going to be me no matter what, or you adapt. And so you can do that with all of these stages of development where you say, oh, I'm going to be me no matter what, or I'm going to take on this new behaviors. And my guess is that's not a, usually a conscious choice. Mm. You know, so, and then there, there are what we're finding with the students that are coming to us these days for training and the certifications um, is a lot of them are over 50. Uh, some of them are younger, but um, a lot of them are uh, in later stages of development. So that some of them may have, for example, a theorist pattern, but they have they have a catalyst look to them because they have more of a, for those of you who are thinking letters, NF pattern, N N T, but um, the, the, the catalyst, part of the catalyst theme looks very much like one of the later stages of consciousness or some later, where it's more about the we, W-E, you know, who we are collectively. And then if you're in a collectivist culture and or an individualist culture, and I'm not sure what's going on in the world right now and how, how that's all going to shift. I mean, I, what flashed in my head was, was Singapore. Mm. Do you know that, that, that how much of the old guard is collectivist and how much of the those who are rebelling against it are no, we have we need to have a new way to do things so it's more individualistic. But I don't know about that. Just lots of questions. I know enough to have lots of questions, not many answers. Fascinating. And so you mentioned terms like the theorist and the catalyst. And so mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could bring us through essential motivators. So um, David Kersey identified, um, he called them temperament. When I did my dissertation, I had to read a whole bunch of books that were written in the 1920s. And, the, and, I found, and I also researched more and more and I found out that there were two, two strains of thought that went back to, I think it's Plato or Galen. And they talk about the humors. And one of those, they, and both of them were called temper, both of those, Kersey had one train of thought and the other one had another and they call, both called them temperament. So when I was following Kersey's, um, and that's what I was trained in, and I learned all kinds of things about in a deep, deep way about each of the four temperament patterns. And um, he called them, was it artisan, guardian? Yeah, artisan, guardian, idealist, and rational. Right. And so... Um, in business, people didn't think we needed idealists here. We need re realists. And um, everybody wanted to be rational. And um, who needs artisans? And that was seen as just bricklayers, not, not, you know, not CEOs, not, not heads of human resources, not psychiatrists and, you know, all kinds of people that you might not expect. And um, the only one that seemed to work was the guardian for, for for the SJ? I think they called them guardians. Well, anyway, yeah. so we we um, we found a lot of bias going into organizations using those terms, 
And so we decided to change the terms and we, we, I'm still not happy with theorist, but anyway. <laughs> and so, and also what happened with, when David Kersey developed this, he linked it to the Myers-Briggs. He was given the Myers-Briggs back before it was really, hadn't had never been published yet really, it was just being tested and read the descriptions and, and he came out INTP and he said, oh my gosh, this woman's been following me around all my life. So he, he really liked Isabel Meyer's work. She liked his work as well. So anyway, we decided to change the names and, and to find names. And I wound up not really liking Theorist, but we f couldn't find one that we liked better. We wanted to have the least amount, what's, what, could, what would get at the essence of the pattern and what would have the least amount is bias triggering. So we came up with stabilizer for guardian or, and in the Myers-Briggs world that was SJ, S and J preferences. And um, for what he called artisan, we've called them improviser because the gift is to turn on a dime and improvise solutions to problems. That's the main tactical gift of, of the uh, improviser. Okay, so well, let me talk a little bit about those two before I give the rest of the names. So that would be S and P in the type code. So extroverted sensing. So those with a preference, those, those which ha who have the improviser pattern of tactical intelligence, that their their core need is to be free to act on, on, on whatever's going on at the moment and to have an impact and to get a result. Now you might think that that's like, you know, tell a joke, people are gonna laugh, you know, you get a response. It might be um, solving, but, but it's also quiet. It can be, you know, you solved this problem. You had an impact. And it might be quietly working on building a software, working and coding, and you know, you got a tangled mess and you sort it all out. Or you create an elegant piece of code that solves the problem really quickly. It's that imp the, you know the ability to improvise solutions, you know, really, and and to get satisfaction from that. Then there's the um, the stabilizer, which is what we call guardian, and and that's to and the, and their preference is SJ, which is introverted sensing, which some people call stabilizing. So they bring stability because what they want is and need is for the world to go on. And their talent is for logistics, for getting everything in place so that things go right and things don't go wrong. Could be information, doesn't get in the wrong hands. It could be all kinds of, all kinds of, of making sure that things go right and things don't go wrong. Providing support, protection, taking care of people. They're not the only ones that take care of people, by the way improvisers and the rest of us do too. So those are the those are those are two of the patterns. So we describe each pattern, by the way, in terms of the core psychological need, and that's what you really have to have in order to be satisfied. So let's talk about theorists. I'll give an example from me and something I said earlier. So the theorist has this core psychological need to be competent and knowledgeable. Now, those with an improviser pattern like to do a, a skillful performance, but for the improviser, it's to be competent, to have a whole toolkit of competencies, things that they're quite capable of doing, and to continually improve those competencies and to be knowledgeable. So those are the, the core psychological needs. And the talent is what we call strategy. So strategy is thinking of things that no one's thought of. Um, it can have two, two forms. One is foreseeing something where you're gonna, you know, where, where you're gonna go, and then what else falls in place is what it's gonna take to get there. Uh, another form of strategy is thinking of, of all the things that might impact uh, an attempted solution. So it's not necessarily quite as visionary in a way, as it is about problem solving, but in a different way than the, than the, the, the um, improviser. Um, so when I said watching myself over time and all of the changes, uh, for me, it's always when I'm 
the stressor is always that I haven't been competent enough. Now, I get stressed if I offend people and I feel like I've been a bad person or I get stressed when I can't get all the work done or when I've been lazy or all kinds of other things. But the ones that are really devastating is where I feel like I don't know enough yet. So the good news is you can, you know, I can always learn, but anyway. Okay, well, so for the last one, that's the, the catalyst. And this is really what, what he called the idealists. And we had a problem with idealists because they were, you know, people said, we don't need idealists around here, we need realists. So there became a bias. I, I experienced that in a workshop somebody else was doing that I, I witnessed. So catalyst, the, the word itself means that from chemistry, this is all I know about chemistry, is that you, you put something in there, it speeds up the interaction, but doesn't become a part of it. You know, so so the, the, the goal for the catalyst is to help people grow and develop to transform situations and people and maintain their own integrity. Because what they need is to have a sense of unique identity and also have a sense of purpose. And I think finally, finally, the world has come around to put purpose up there with a bunch of other things, you know, because now what we're realizing in many places in our society, the way the world is now, is that you have to have a purpose. Purpose is what will make you thrive. And so we have an organization that, uh, or several, a couple of organizations that focus on as for purpose enterprises. And they take a lot of energy and attention on what is our purpose, not just to make money but what is our purpose? And so I find a lot of people doing purpose work right now. So, And oftentimes when people come to me for the courses and I do a one-on-one -on -one interview and help them be sure they, you know, where, where are they on their best fit? So I get to know them, but also to help them be clear. Or when people are still confused, I often ask them if they've done purpose work because purpose work means that you've asked yourself those questions and come up with, there's, there's some very good processes for that. Um, come up with really a realization of what your purpose is. Because once you find your purpose, you have lots of energy. So, so and, and David Cruzy called the talent of the, this, this uh, catalyst pattern to be um, diplomacy. Um, this is not like political diplomacy. This is about uh, knowing what to say to make someone feel good, to, to help them grow and develop even, uh, and to build really, really, and the negotiation is getting people to agree on something, that's tactical. Diplomacy is getting people to resolve the, the real conflicts going on and come to some solution. So those are the four essential motivator patterns, and there are four variations of each one. There are four variations of each one? Well, yeah, because we have 16 personality types. Oh, okay. I was like, ooh, more to learn. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, for example, my pattern is, we gave names to each of the 16 types. So my pattern is um, designer theorizer. So people see my theorizing. They don't necessarily might see my designing. And I noticed one time that I hadn't been doing much designing. I'd been doing mostly teaching and facilitating. And then the logistics behind running a company and all that and developing those courses. And, and it was really that, it, that was what I was missing, was missing that. And so I don't remember all the names Dario Nardi and I came up with them. There are two words, the first one people don't usually, other people might not see, but you would recognize it in yourself. And then there's the other one. So those are four patterns. Now you can look at those patterns through a cognitive dynamics lens or the eight function lens and see you know, what processes you lead with. You can look at those patterns in terms of interaction styles. There's an in-charge version and a behind-the-scenes version and chart the course and get things going version of each of the four patterns. Then we have 16 types. <laughs> yeah, well, voila. <laughs> voila. That's amazing. The catalyst describes me to a T. It's almost like reading someone who knows everything about my life. That mm -hmm. is my core self, being yeah. a catalyst. That is, 
That is so rad that you already know that about me without knowing me. That's kind of yeah, like seeing into someone's soul, basically, when you know their essential motivator, mm -hmm. you know a part of their soul. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah. And then then there are all these variables that make things make people look different. Mm. No. So. For sure. Definitely. And a really cool concept you talk about, Linda, is the be like me bias that you talk about. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could go a little bit into that. Oh, yeah. Actually, I got that from my first business partner, Dr. Sue Cooper. We went through our master's in counseling together and we finished our doctorates at the same place in the same time. And, and we decided we would go into business together consulting. And um, she had a private practice. I had a small private practice. And, and she was active in the type world and, and, and the local type community. And she, she said to me one time, you know, the, everybody has this disease. It's BLM syndrome. Well, now we have new, new meaning for BLM, but, you know, be like me. And so what it means is we, we go around expecting other people to be like us. You know, I once talked to a counselor I, I, at, at, at Cal State Fullerton. I, I was, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was, you know, I, I had a, a three or four year old baby, you know, I, I married. Uh, and she talked to me about how, you know, the kinds of arguments husbands and wives get into, you know, about how to load the dishwasher and all these little, little things. And so, Amazingly, all kinds of things are things we expect other people to be like us. And, and so when they're not, then they're, you know, you know what's wrong with them. They're, they're crazy. They're bad. No good. Failures, whatever we want to label. Um, novels are written about this. Movies are made about this. They don't call it be like me syndrome. But anyway, we have it. And it doesn't go away, really. Uh, other than the more we know about differences and the more we honor differences, the more we can not get caught. And then the other one that goes with that is BLT, be like them. And so a lot of times we wind up um, feeling like we're not okay and that we need to be like other people. And then we give up our, our power and our strength. And it can be momentary, you know, it can be performance and be, you know, like somebody can, I, I the British Association for Psychological <clears throat> Type had a conference this year and I, I watched some of the people that I've trained actually um, teach and I'm like, oh, I want to be able to do that. They were so good on Zoom getting people involved with, I don't know, just the pacing and the whole thing. So I still have BLM and BLT. You know, it's still, it's still there. Um, but uh, in, in a business setting, that makes a lot of sense. You don't want people trying to be like somebody else. And you have conflict because they're trying to convince everybody to be like them. So anyway, that, that's, that's thanks to Dr. Sue Cooper. Those are really poignant terms because it kind of is one of the core reasons a lot of people learn typology. Mm -hmm because it gets you to embrace who you are. Here are your gifts you bring to mm -hmm. the world. Here is your superpower. Now mm -hmm. embrace that, make the most out of that. And you don't have to feel shame over being different than mm -hmm. other people. And the moment you hone your beauty is the moment you contribute the most to the world. And I feel like that's a beautiful message the BLM and BLT teaches us. Oh. And yeah, it, it also goes back to the roots of trauma mm -hmm. because when we have be like them, it is actually traumatic to your core self because you're telling yourself when you're acting like someone else, you're not enough as you are. Yeah. And that compounded over time, it really affects your psyche, whether or not you know it in mm -hmm. either small ways and sometimes in huge ways. And so sometimes really embracing type helps to overcome some deep rooted lifelong traumas of feeling like you always had to be someone else to be worthy of right. being someone good in the world. And, and if you're experiencing like some of the people that, that I've met 
who have experienced severe trauma, that's the biggest message in the world that who you are is not okay. At least at that, you know, there, there, there's severe trauma that comes from natural catastrophes. And we could also have some severe trauma just, just from having to exist in COVID in a way. Um, but, but the kind where kids get beaten and abused, uh, that big, it's a big message. So it's no wonder that sometimes people who've had that experience have a really hard time finding what is their best fit. Mm. Absolutely. It becomes harder, harder to know your type when there are a lot of factors like that right. influencing it. And so a lot of people say the phrase, a lot of learning is really unlearning. <laughs> and so my belief there is that a lot of life when you're older is unlearning trauma. And so when you learn about type, you realize why it's okay to have the strengths that you have. And in a way, it allows you to be more confident in the person that you are so that you can make the most out of that. And then mm -hmm. you can catalyze that. <laughs> yeah. Instead of, yeah. yeah. And you can really reach your potential as a human being when you realize that the potential was always within you yeah. instead of externally located. <laughs> Agreed. I, th I think cognitive dynamics helps um, not so much well, it, it does help with the identity question, you know, who am I really? It also gives us a, a roadmap for understanding what our developmental path might be. So it helps us understand and, and make space for those other kinds of perspectives and approaches, I suppose. You know, one of the most helpful things for me once at a conference, um, we had sent boxes of things to be passed out for free. And, you know, that was kind of an expense and they didn't pass them out in their packets. So I was bitching and moaning and talking to the organizer about it and uh, trying to, you know, say, well, I'm sure I sent those instructions, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, and he was really busy registering three people in and all that. And he said, Linda, you know, do you want to be right, right or do you want to be liked? And, and so that was one of those nice, ex nice, not so nice experiences where I had to face that I was, you know, projecting all kinds of things and not really taking other people into account and not being compassionate about how much stress he was under and, you know, just being my own whatever. And I don't know how old I was. I'm a few years older now than I was then, but not a lot. <laughs> so. So that, that, that those kinds of things help me, but having, for me anyway, having a framework to understand, I mean, I can name, oh, you did it again, Linda. You did your own introverted thinking, introverted feeling, actually, both of those. And, and you didn't do extroverted feeling. You didn't take someone else's condition into account. So I don't know why I had to say that one, but I, <laughs> it just seemed like that, that, Cognitive, it, for me and many people, cognitive dynamics helps me name something, and then it's easier for me to learn some new behaviors, if, even if it's not a developmental thing. Absolutely, yeah. As an INTP, you're going to feel the compulsion to sometimes use your TI, even when the context does not always warrant TI. And so yes. something learning type teaches us is that because you are good at your right hand doesn't mean you have to use your right hand in every scenario. <laughs> With your dominant function, there's a proclivity to kind of want to overuse it in scenarios where it's not applicable. Right. So learning about type teaches us that there are certain places where it's warranted and other areas where it's not as effective to use it. So it's almost like you're able to see the correct uses of the tool of your dominant function and the incorrect places to use right. it as well. Right. And that's a really amazing example you gave. Mm. It's kind of related to the necessary, true, kind rule. So basically, there's this statement that goes around that says, when it satisfies two out of the three of these things, it's good to say it. But when it's not, then <laughs> it's not. So is this necessary? Is this true? And is this kind? Wow. And it wasn't even necessary or kind. <laughs> yeah, but the TI is like, 
but it's true. <laughs> but it's true. I did give those to you in plenty of time. They had them there. They were under the counter. I want to say, what did you think of them? <laughs> Instead of here, let me help you. I'll stuff these in their packets. Mm. Yeah, so, yeah. 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 It's like when you have a hammer, you want to use it to bang down every nail. Even when a thing is not a nail, you're still like, yeah, I have a hammer in my mm -hmm. hand. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and a nail that's trying to hold up a picture isn't supposed to go all the way in. That's true. <laughs> Good point. Good point. Yeah. I was just wondering if I'd really answered your question about all these reasons, you know, how the things that affect the variations. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, there are a lot, I'm sure there are others, but those are the main ones, you know, the culture uh, and, and in the broadest sense, you know, the family, the, the region you grow up in, the peer, I mean, it could be just a peer group can affect, mm. affect it. And, um, and then I think there's something about your life purpose, your journey, that there's probably a reason why my path was developed to develop what I developed to, to accomplish my purpose. Whereas my husband's, not only are we gender, you know, gender difference, which makes some hormones do make a little difference, Mm -hmm. But you know his his journey was to not to to develop it differently and at a different time, mm -hmm. even though we had the same type pattern. Yeah, so individual differences, wonderful things. Absolutely, we all have our idiosyncrasies and the things <laughs> that make us a little quirky, due to a myriad of reasons. Yeah. Thank you so much, Linda Behrens, You're for welcome. coming out and sharing your knowledge and wisdom on the interaction styles on the essential motivators and on the very interesting namings for each of the 16 <laughs> types that you have and how there's a core self and a developed self and a contextual self. Mm -hmm. It is really good information to munch on for those who have an informative, <laughs> an informative style of learning that loves to soak in new information. And I think they'll really enjoy this. No, oh, thanks. That was fun. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it's wonderful what you really contributed to the community. Interaction styles is a very unique contribution. And I think that it adds a lot of dimension and flavor to type. Mm -hmm. It helps solve a lot of problems in the type space. ESTPs will complain about people thinking they're TE doms all the time. And it's because they share an interaction style of take charge. And mm -hmm. so people think, oh, <laughs> and in charge. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the first time we named it, we called it take charge. But now it's in charge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So when they see that in chargeness of the ESTP, people tend to mistype them as oh, TE doms. Okay. But they know they're ESTPs. So they're like, why is everyone mistyping me as a TE dom? I don't get it. So Well, and then ENFJ has an in charge style as well, which is like, whoa, wait a minute, I thought you had a feeling preference. <laughs> Where's that coming from? Yeah, it helps make sense of a, a lot of variables in type yeah. that people found perplexing. So it adds reason to something that was otherwise very complex and hard for people to kind of grasp, yeah. which really shows your theorist strength because you're <laughs> able to take the complexity of theories and the nuances of theories and really combine them into these eloquent solutions, these eloquent concepts that you've created and that yeah. is your contribution to type and your theorist talent of bringing these really well thought out theories to. Well, to now, I, I've had so much help from lots of people. So um, I feel like it's all, almost everything has been a team effort of some kind. So mm -hmm. it's really, um, I, I still don't think I own it. <laughs> yeah, that is true. The most beautiful things in life are created through teamwork. Teamwork mm -hmm. makes dreamworks. Yeah. And it goes back to what you were saying about be like me and be like them. Mm -hmm. That's not true teamwork. When you want someone to be like you or you are forcing yourself to be like someone else, that's taking away all the potential you could have if you both used each other's strengths mm -hmm. or collaborated each other's strengths. 
to create something beautiful together. The more we embrace our divine design, the more we are able to bring what we are meant to bring. And the concepts that you teach really help us with learning to contribute in a way that gives us most bang for our buck. So you, you teach you. us the ways of living that give us the most leverage, the most, like you teach us the low hanging fruit of our personality. And so that we're able to keep that in mind more as we go through life. And hopefully mm -hmm. that makes waves in people's lives. <laughs> well, then I feel fulfilled. Mm, yeah. 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 A lot of people really enjoy your work, Linda. You're very well quoted. I just think <laughs> that not a lot of people know who you actually are. So it's more like, <laughs> it's kind of like the voice of God that no one knows who, oh my God. who it actually looks like <laughs> or talks like. <laughs> but it's mm. like humanizing to, to see you as a person. And we're like, oh, she's mm. a just like us. <laughs> I, I... I'm glad. <laughs> I'm also aware, very aware that I'm having a lot of word finding problems these days, but all I can do is laugh at myself. So, um, you know, I, I, I always had some word finding problems, you know, some remembering somebody's name or something. And I, find, I figured out that I had too many file drawers in my head. So I couldn't remember where the file drawer was. It wasn't that I didn't remember the person. So, so anyway, so it's a, uh, it's uh, interesting journey. So. Yeah, no yeah, worries. Thank you. <laughs> this has been a pleasure. Linda, she owns Interstrengths. So if you want to check that out, it's in the links below. It's a great way to investigate typology through the interaction styles and with a flavoring of Linda Barron's work throughout her many years of being obsessed with type. <laughs> Thank you. It's incurable. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. Once you start having tight vision, you never go back. <laughs> right. Right. Mm. Thank you so much. It's fun always to talk with you, Joyce. So thanks. Yay. It feels, feels really good. Thanks. This is amazing. This is an honor. <laughs> and thank you, Linda, for, for coming out and being your wonderful self. <laughs> thanks. Your, ca your catalyst is showing. <laughs> Hi everyone. <laughs> Thanks okay. for watching. Mm -hmm.